Hello and welcome to Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. I'm your host, Andrew Heaton, and I hope you had a good Memorial Day. I did. However, today, I forgot to bring my laptop to work. And so, if I seem a little scattered, it's because I did not actually write this monologue. I'm just winging it to you off the top of my head because I didn't have access to a keyboard or anything like that. Over the weekend, George Takei, the guy that played Sulu, tweeted out, I'm tempted to move to... I'm tempted to move to Kentucky just to run against Mitch McConnell. And then subsequently, Mark Hamill tweeted out, I'm tempted to move to Kentucky just so I could vote for you. Hashtag ditch Mitch. That would be amazing. I would love for that to happen. So Kentucky already has Rand Paul and Thomas Massey, the the two more libertarian-leaning members of Congress. If Kentucky became an election between either libertarians or sci-fi celebrities, I could not be happier. Usually elections in America are between a corrupt sociopath and an incompetent sociopath. Those are usually your options. But if the options were a libertarian or a sci-fi celebrity, I would move to Kentucky too, because that would be a phenomenal election. So I encourage George K to do that. I think it'd be great. I would absolutely love that. John Voight, another celebrity, came out on Twitter and had a whole film speech, you can watch it, where he said that Trump is the greatest president since Lincoln. Uh, John Voight is famous for being eaten by a snake in Anaconda and uh, being in the film Deliverance, where I believe he was uh, eaten by a snake, and in Transformers, where he, uh, he, was, he turned into a robot snake. And he's the father of Angelina Jolie, who will not return my calls. Nonetheless, a very uh, strong showing for, uh, for Donald Trump. That is in contrast to Justin Amash, who we're going to talk about to a great extent today. Justin Amash last week uh, announced that he thought Trump had committed an impeachable offense, and he has been doubling down on that ever since then. So I'm, I'm going to tip the deck on, on what I think is happening with Donald Trump and impeachment. This, this is my, my, my actual realistic take on the situation as it's happening. I think 99% of the people talking about impeachment have no idea what the threshold for impeachment is or what obstruction of justice is and probably didn't read the Mueller report. I fall into that category. I am part of the 99% who really doesn't know that much. Uh, All of us, I think, in that category are ultimately just saying whether or not we want Trump to be impeached, not whether or not he should be impeached. Now, I will say, I think Justin Amash is part of that 1%. He actually did read the Mueller report. Uh, Amash reads all of the legislation he votes on, which is not something members of Congress routinely do. My read on the impeachment proceedings, as best that I can get from uh, from Justin Amash, and if you watch uh, Judge Napolitano on Reason, he had an interesting thing as well. I think that Trump probably obstructed justice insofar as Nixon did. Ergo, you could do impeachment proceedings against him because he obstructed justice. So that's where I'm sitting at right now. And the, uh, the critique that, well, he didn't collude with the Russians, he was exonerated of that. I think that would kind of be like saying if Nixon had done all of the cover-up that he did, but it turned out the guys that he was covering up for hadn't actually made off with the files, it would still have been a crime. However, I want to say this. I think that when it comes to impeachment, it is so far kind of fuzzy Uh, While I would side with Justin Amash on this one over all of the other Republicans in Congress, uh, I don't think the smoking gun is super present. Where I do think it's present and where I do think it's impeachable is this. Last week, President Trump declared a national emergency in order to bypass the will of Congress and the Constitution to sell arms to Saudi Arabia, which, as I frequently remind you, is a despotic medieval theocracy that has nothing in common with American values. Congress had previously stopped us from selling arms to Saudi Arabia, and the president said, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway, which I think is a clear abrogation of the Constitution is an impeachable offense. Now, I would say on top of that, uh, for for people that are starting to percolate uh, at me for potentially being a partisan, I would have felt the same way about Obama when we invaded Libya. Congress didn't invade, uh, uh, give us permission to invade Libya. That was something that Obama just decided to do. And I find it very, very dangerous when presidents start winging it outside of the rule of law based on what they think is correct, even if it's not legal. And I think we've crossed that threshold. However, we'll get into all of that and more with a very funny, fun guy, which is uh, uh, Brian Brushwood, my friend here in a minute. Before we do so, however, we do need to give a shout out to our sponsor. 
Something's Off with Andrew Heaton is brought to you by the Waterproof Guitar from Aquatic Acoustics. Where are the best acoustics in your house? Your bathroom, right? If you sing in your closet, it's kind of muffled. Your kitchen's too echoey. Your basement is haunted. But your bathroom has just the right sound profile for you to sound like you're channeling Bing Crosby when you feel like singing. But, of course, you don't want to ruin a perfectly good guitar by lugging it into the shower with you. Until now. Every waterproof guitar can withstand up to thunderstorm hydration conditions so that you can play guitar while taking a shower for hours at a time. If you're like me, you've done some things you're not proud of, and you feel dirty about it. Defiled on some unfathomably deep level, as if the bone marrow of your soul is filled with evil from the unspeakable acts you did back in Nam. Sometimes I'll just spend half the day in the shower vigorously scrubbing myself and muttering about war crimes. I usually go through three or four bars of soap a week. Never feel clean, though. And I love singing. So what a nifty treat it is to be able to practice guitar for five or six hours at a time. I'm already going to be in the shower, so why not learn how to play Wonderwild while I'm doing it? The Waterproof Guitar from Aquatic Acoustics. Play yourself a moist melody. And now, a homily from Father Michael O'Grimsley, Vicar of the Church of Woke. Thank you. Please be seated. You may open your smartphones to Twitter so that you may live tweet your thoughts. Today, I must speak to you about the grave and mortal sin of cultural appropriation. Not three weeks ago, we had to excommunicate several members of this very congregation who hurtfully and sinfully bought pinatas for a Cinco de Mayo party, while white, reeking of original privilege. Now, some of the Latinx members of this congregation said things like, actually, we don't particularly care, or that's great, have fun, or look, it's just an excuse to drink margaritas, lighten up. Fortunately, they were shouted down by the wokest among us, who, entirely coincidentally, are upper middle class college educated white people like myself. For centuries in Europe, the powers that be forced people to live separately in ethnic ghettos. Segregation in the United States kept African Americans from eating at diners that white people had or intermarrying. But brave men and women who believed in freedom and the dignity of human beings brought down these walls so that everyone could mingle freely as one people. Which would have been fine as long as everyone had stuck with their own ethnic cuisine, hatware, musical instruments, traditional dances, and religious festivals. Remember, you are not an individual. You're a component of a racial demographic. And if you enjoy something unique to another demographic, it's not discovery, it's theft. So let us go forth and champion the doctrine of cultural appropriation so that we may rebuild those ethnic ghettos, not in law or in space, but in culture. For as we fight the Orange One and his vile wall along the border, we must at the same time erect our own walls between the cultures and peoples of the United States in our minds, so that one day we might truly build a shining city on a hill and a separate one for Asians and Hispanics and so forth. Through the grace of Captain Planet, and the intercessions of the holy hierarchy of victimhood. Amen. My guest today is Brian Brushwood, a very funny person, a magical person, and the host of nine different podcasts, I believe. Brian, what are some of the podcasts people can check you out on? Uh, you know what? None of them matter because we did it, Andrew. We uh, can declare victory. Number one complaint every time I show on is people say, he sounds too clear, and I wish he sounded like he was on AM radio. And Perfect. finally, we made it happen. Nice. We did it. Are you, does that mean you're on the phone rather than Opal? Uh, yes. <laughs> ah, good. Yes. Ah, my arch nemesis, Opal. Yeah, that, uh, well, uh, but delightful to have you here, AM radio or not. Uh, oh, no, it's awesome to be here and not as awesome as I am convinced that uh, George Decay and, and, and Luke Skywalker have to team up with the Free State Project <sighs> to make the Geek State Project, 
where everybody moves to Kentucky. It'll be a libertarian <laughs> slash geek paradise. That sounds fun. I would, I would definitely, I would 100% do the Geek State Project. That sounds wonderful. And uh, I, like, again, I think that that would be a, a, like a great dichotomy of options. I mean, they're going to go libertarian or sci-fi geek. Okay, I'll, I'll live in that world. That seems like a better situation than what I have right now. I mean, it's tough. It's like I, you go to the polling booth and you think to yourself, well, it is a socialist nightmare, but it is Star Trek. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. I do. I, see, I think maybe... I don't. I don't think that uh, George Takei would ever become a libertarian. I don't think that would happen. But I feel like, I feel like someone who has literally been locked in a cage by the federal government because of their ethnicity, and he has. He he was part of the internment camp that happened in World War II, not having done anything. I have to think that there is somewhere in there a very healthy skepticism of state power lurking around and it's because that's my thing is I'm, I'm just i am i am very skeptical of power and power accumulation and and i i i feel like if i could talk to him and be like can we at least acknowledge that 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 is an issue i mean m most i find most progressives are big fans of fdr and it's like even that guy that you love still locked up innocent japanese people in internment camps so I, maybe we should kind of limit the power to the state you know, and also on a meta level, if 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 we could get Luke Skywalker and Sulu to agree, because you know Star Trek was pretty much idealized uh, socialism, communism, uh, and and Star Wars was pretty much idealized libertarianism. And if the two of them are coming together to fight uh, uh, Darth McConnell, then I, I think there's something going Wait, on. Wait, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. We're going to scrap everything involving impeachment. We'll just go back and root out the monologue. Why, why do you think that Star Wars is, is uh, libertarian and Star Trek is socialist? Oh, are you kidding me? Okay, so uh, Star Trek is everything organized, everything master planned. Um, and very competent. Everybody's, everybody's, have you noticed that in Star Trek that everyone is 100% competent at all times? Uh, that, yeah, that I think right there is a, the, the science fiction element. In Star Trek, every person gives according to their ability and receives according to their need. You are correct. Hmm, okay, yeah. Whereas in Star Wars, you have an oppressive... Uh, overarching government that everybody gives the middle finger to. And instead, everything is about the free market. You want some spice from Kessel? We can make that happen. And instead, free individuals uh, uh, negotiate rates, including, you know, passage out of Mos Eisley Cantina. Uh, at, 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 I, 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 how have you never noticed that Star Wars is libertarianism and Star Trek is socialism? <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I'm going to put a pin in it, but only for this reason. I want to do a full episode on that. I think that that would be okay. a, a phenomenal episode. And uh, I have yet to get tired of the segment we call alienating the audience, where we just deep dive on sci-fi. So can, can, we, can we do that in the future? Because this sounds like a great yeah. episode. We, we, uh, we will come armed with our with our uh, objective cases. Wonderful. Well, bef before we get on to Justin Amash, we get on to Trump. Um, you were talking to me yesterday about you you uh, are fairly confident that there is a sort of regulatory capture slash uh, conspiracy, perhaps going on with vaping. And I, given that Mitch McConnell has just uh, endorsed legislation to raise the minimum buying age of tobacco to 21 across the country. Do you, do you see him as uh, being on team vape? Or actually, well, well, can yeah. you just unpack what's going on for people? Because that sounds crazy, whatever I just said, with that explanation. Keep, keep in mind, keep in mind, I'm only saying this because I sound like I'm on AM radio, and it brings out <laughs> the conspiracy theorist in me, right? But yesterday, there was like four or five things. Maybe I'm just being targeted by, you know, by the right ads at the right time or whatever. But uh, I went to Axios.com, and there's this whole think piece about, like, why it's so important that we raised all tobacco use age to 21. And I, and I was like, why are they spending money to demonize their own product. And, and of course, um, uh, when it comes to Juul, uh, 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 first of all, here are some things that seem to be true to me, and, and somebody can easily conflict all of us. Number one, it seems like vaping nicotine is a billion times safer than smoking cigarettes, right? Yeah. It seems like Juul is far more popular. They are a rising market in young people rather than a de declining market. It also seems like uh, very few studies have been done on whether or not vaping is inherently safer than cigarettes and what the effects of nicotine absent all of the billions of other bad chemicals in cigarettes are. So it feels to me like if you are in a dominant position in this market, a good idea would be to spend your marketing dollars to set up, to, to declare 
that the age should go up to 21 so that you could buy yourself three years to fund a bunch of studies saying how much safer vaping nicotine is rather than cigarettes. It, 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 and, you know, maybe, maybe donate, uh, I don't know, $160,000 to Mitch McConnell along the way to make sure that, uh, that, that you buy yourself a little bit of legislation. It feels to me like, like this is a move to take on cigarettes, traditional cigarettes. And what you need to do is buy time. And I'm pretty sure that's why Jewel is spending all this money to, to do it now, now, I'm just trying this thought on for size, but does that does any of that ring true with you? Yeah, well, I'm like I, I I'll say that in general, whenever you see legislation like this, I think you need to keep an eye out for regulatory capture. I suspect people who listen to the program are familiar with it. If you're not familiar with the term regulatory capture, regulatory capture is this: let's say that a hotel burns down and several people die. It's a tragedy. Everybody's against it. Um, it's really really sad. What will typically happen in the wake of that? is some compendium of very large corporate hotel owners will approach Congress and say, we think this is awful, and what we want to do is help you, Congress, write legislation to protect people. And then what they'll do is they'll write legislation, like the lobbyists will basically come in and, and give Congress what it needs to do, and it'll say, well, every, every hotel legally must have, um, for safety reasons, must have let's say mm, the exact amount of uh, emergency fire exits that my hotel happens to have. And every hotel has to have the exact amount of uh, water sprinkler systems that, again, coincidentally, my, my hotel already happens to have. And basically what they're doing is they're using the opportunity to use force of law in order to squeeze out smaller competitors. So that their goal is to run out of town, Air Airbnb, or run out of town, uh, actual uh, B&Bs and that kind of thing. That, that's a hypothetical scenario. However, it right. is basically how regulatory capture works, and I could see that definitely happening with tobacco. Well, and especially because, you know, most people define their brand preferences in their late teenage years, and they stick with them forever and ever and ever. So ah, right. And you're in a dominant uh, position. The one thing you want to do is make sure that nobody else is marketing your, your, I don't know, Vipe or Blue or any of those alternate ones out there. You want to block them out by saying not only should they not be able to be bought to 21 and up, they should – um, uh, it should be illegal to try to market to anyone under 21 years old, which of course would be doubly hypocritical because Jewel, that's the one thing they got dinged on recently. Vice did this amazing story where they talked about all of the influencers on Instagram with these kids, these 16 years, 17 year olds who are doing incredible vape tricks. Mm. Jewel was sponsoring a whole bunch of these guys and, and they got dinged on it. So of course, what do you do? You flip, uh, you flip the switch and go the other way. And that, Regulatory capture, man. That is a that is a powerful that's a powerful idea. Um, uh, just to to make it all about me because this is AM radio. Yeah. Um, when 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 I first wanted to learn to eat fire, I was like, well, I'm going to buy the best book on fire eating out there, and there wasn't one. And so I ended up writing it. It's called The Professional's Guide to Fire Eating. Nice. I interviewed you know scientists and magicians and and all this stuff. Good uh, plug. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. great. I'm, I'm going to go buy it. Awesome. But, 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 but here's the thing is I realized that every single municipality has their own separate set of rules about performing with any kind of fire on stage. And it occurred to me like, well, this is a mishmash, you know, half the times, you know, the, uh, some, some people need a fire marshal there. Other people really could give a rat's ass. And it occurred to me that, oh, wow, there's an opportunity here. If I wanted to, I could declare myself king of the International Fire Eating uh, Regulatory Commission. Please do that. And I could make a a, a, a a big campaign of reaching out to lawmakers saying no theater should ever have any fire whatsoever unless they're officially sanctioned by the king of fire eating, Brian Brushwood yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So it's like there's a way to, uh, you know, get, get commission fees, to, to get bookings, to become the authority on all that stuff. And and this is really is what it feels like that, that Jewel is doing right now. That, that, would, that would not surprise me at all. I won't go so far as to say that Mitch McConnell is a part of it. He might be. It wouldn't surprise me, given that he is a legislator and that there might be lobbyists involved. But I but I've not seen a direct correlation. W what I will say um, irritates me with Mitch McConnell is kind of out of the blue from my perspective. He came out and said, we're going to make a federal law. Um, that prohibits anyone from uh, anyone under the age of 21 from buying tobacco. And I looked at that and went, "Aren't you supposed to be a states' right guy? Like, what what happened to that? Like, I but I, I think Mitch McConnell is ultimately a power broker. He's not an ideologue. He's a power broker. And so yeah. when when he is in power, states' rights, local control, individual freedom, all of that stuff's kind of secondary to whatever his agenda is. 
Yeah, and and let's face it, um, that's that's a pretty good. If you're looking at the buffet of of causes to to tackle and to make your own or whatever, I mean, who's gonna who's gonna come out swinging against the idea that buying tobacco should should have a higher age uh, yeah. entry? You know, I mean, it's 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 a it's a safe thing to do. And of course, you know, uh, uh, he's he's Kentucky, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, he's Kentucky as well. Kentucky's a little bit of tobacco happening in. Mm-hmm. Kentucky. So uh, yeah. I, I don't know. No, it, the fair, it's like a sort of a milk toast, uh, a, a safe bet for him to make. But but mainly, I'm fascinated by the money Jewel is spending to agree with it. Th- this whole idea of uh, demonizing your own product in the short term in order to guarantee long term dominance is, I think, a savvy pay, play on their part. I I think what we all need to do is encourage George Decay to run for Congress and then go buy stock in uh, Jewel or whoever owns it because they seem like they're very smart. That seems like a good long-term... If you're looking to do it to expand beyond your index portfolio, that seems like a decent thing. So, I'll, I'll tell you what, Ed, yeah. uh, uh, Forget Jewel. I want Sulu. Nice. Oh, uh, God, you did a pun. Okay, we're going we're gonna to end that conversation and move on to <laughs> Justin Amash. What do you think about Justin Amash calling for Trump's impeachment? Uh, I, th- I think it's a principled stance. Uh, I think this this is really a question. There's a lot of different ways to spin it. Um, uh, of course, the the boring crap is, you know, ah, he defected from the team or whatever. Uh, I think he did it from a place of genuine principality. And I believe the question that w- most honest people should be asking themselves is one of tactics versus uh, integrity. Uh, I think what he's doing is tactically a very dumb move because impeachment will go nowhere. Yeah. But I think it is one that comes from a place of absolute integrity. And the question that uh, I, I don't think he's going to inspire a landslide of Republicans suddenly also jumping on board. But here's the real question is when it comes to how do we define an impeachable offense? Do Where do we want that line to be? And I, 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 first of all, let me make it clear. I think there's no chance that Donald Trump ever gets really impeached. I yeah. think that tactically it's suicide for anybody to do it. But I don't tend to think of the person. I tend to think of the office. As right. you and I have talked before, as much as I dislike Trump as a person, I adore the uh, the weakened presidency. I am glad to see for the first time in the last 20 years, people realize, oh, wait, when we make a God King out of a president, uh, sometimes a bad person uh, ends up in that office. And so the question is, what are we saying to future presidents as far as the behavior that is detailed in the Mueller report that was done by Donald Trump? And I think the only principled position is I, I think you have to impeach and you have to let it fail so mm. that history, not not this guy, because we're not going to have any effect on this guy. Yeah. Uh, but but so that history knows that future presidents know that even <laughs> that incompetently attempting to block and obstruct uh, the investigation of your own uh, uh, situation is not cool <laughs> in the presidency. Yeah, I, I think, uh, again, because I, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of, of impeachment proceedings, but it would seem to me that the, the situation paralleling this might be if, say, somebody came to President Nixon and went, hey, we think some of your guys broke into Watergate, and he went, cover it up, cover it up. And then the guys that he told to cover it up didn't cover it up because they knew it was illegal, but he'd done everything he could to attempt to obstruct it. That's the kind of the comparable situation we're in. And as far as I know, attempted obstruction of justice is impeachable grounds, because when we get into impeachment, it's high, high crimes and misdemeanors, which is left intentionally vague by the founders because they didn't have it uh, nailed down to any type of statutory limitations. And if you were to go into, say, like Hamilton or Madison, Hamilton and Madison would be very much more in the the camp of uh, he's violated public trust, ergo he has to go. They would be a lot more robust in their interpretation of this, which is interesting. That's well, I, where, where Amash seems to be going, although he does have a far better grip of uh, how how the technical element of, you know, crimes as related to impeachment work than, you know, I do, of course. Yeah, well, well so it, now I, I encourage people to stay out of the weeds of what is and isn't a high crime and mis- misdemeanor. Um, uh, what's, what's the thing where a jury can... Find somebody not guilty. Jury nullification. Yeah, there we go. I, 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 this feels to me like a jury nullification thing because uh, let's say Trump showed up today 
did a press conference and said, you know what? Um, I'm going to play Fortnite from full on. My uh, <laughs> Twitch stream is twitch.tv slash Trump dog. Uh, with five G, <laughs> that would uh, I would be all in favor of that. If Trump got off Twitter, and just started playing Fortnite, that would be great. Well, and, and keep in mind, he would not be committing a crime, but that would be an impeachable action. So, so remember that impeachment is really just a manifestation of political will, and that's why we're seeing Democrats recoil from it because they understand that there's no chance of it going through, and they are playing tactics. They're not playing. Uh, uh, the moral game. And I, and I think you can make a strong moral, moral case. And I think that's what uh, Justin's doing is, is saying uh, from a moral position, I feel like these are impeachable actions for the commander in chief to undertake. And to be consistent with my own ethics, I feel like I have to be in favor of in, in impeachment. Mm. I, I will. The only part that I'll disagree with you on that is I do think that it's it's to his tactical advantage as well. Now, I'll say, like, I, I think that Justin Amash is an, a very integrative guy. He's clearly an ideological thinker. Uh, he, he has a very clear set of principles that he's adhering to, which I mostly agree with. He's my favorite member of Congress. So I, this is not a, an attack on his integrity, but I do think it could be a good tactical move for him as well. Uh, Justin Amash is not beloved by the Republican Party. He's had primary challenges before. He is a primary challenger right now. It wouldn't surprise me at all if the state of Michigan attempted to gerrymander him out of existence. Um, in fact, I've, I've heard some, some things that would indicate that's already under the way. So if I'm Justin Amash and I know that the full force of the presidency is going to come down on me, I am going to have a primary challenge from the party. And there's a good chance the party is going to try and make it uh, electorally impossible for me to run anyway. At that point... I am. I would be a lot more open to being full-throated about a moral position I'd already taken, because at that point he has a little bit more of a splash that he could run on if he decided to run for president as a libertarian, or if he decided to challenge Trump in the primaries along with Bill Weld, or in the less likely event that he decided to switch and become a Democrat, which a couple of people fluttered out, I don't think that will happen. Uh, but were he thinking about that, he would. It would grease the wheels a little bit for him to enter the Democratic Party if he'd already come out as the only Republican to call for Trump's impeachment. How, uh, how are you feeling right now as far as um, the, the Republican brand? And again, uh, reminders to folks who haven't heard me before. I'm, I don't have a dog in this fight. Yeah. I'm a crazy libertarian. Uh, but as far as the Republican brand of positioning itself as the party of morals and ethics and family values and honesty, um, it has been very a very strange three years to watch the mental gymnastics that I've seen a lot of people go, especially on the evangelical uh, uh, Christian right, to justify support for, for Trump. And it felt like this moment was, was sort of a breath of fresh air of somebody like, no, 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 all that corny stuff we've been saying for 30 years, I actually believe it. And I think this is an impeachable offense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'll say the mental gymnastics that have happened across the board over the last three years have been amazing. Because Trump is so polarizing that whatever he – there's a contingent of Republicans that are going to 100 percent agree with whatever he says regardless. And there's a contingent of progressives who are going to disagree with whatever he says regardless. Um, there are, I, I feel like right now there are very few people um, that are, are actively discussing politics that are not – completely sovereign in some way, either either reactively or proactively to what Trump is saying. Um, so it, like with, with Democrats, a lot of my Democratic friends have now found that they are, in fact, very uh, large proponents of the free market, uh, whereas they previously weren't. They're also very concerned about character in office, which they previously weren't. Um, on the Republican side, meanwhile, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, I I the, the the best argument I have heard for traditional Republicans in, in favor of Donald Trump, which I disagree with, but I think it's the best one, is if you're concerned, if you're if say you're very, very pro-life and you're very concerned about judges, sort of a hold your nose strategy of vote for Trump. He's a scumbag, but we're going to get some some justices out of it. Uh, I, 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 I see where they're going with that for the people that really think he's actually a good person and is doing a good job. Uh, I think that's a very bizarre thing, and it's difficult. I'll put it this way. For anybody that is uh, fully supporting Donald Trump um, as a moral choice, as, as in he is, I am voting for him because I think he is a good person, uh, I, I'm never going to take that person seriously again if in the future they want to impeach a Bill Clinton-like person because they've had uh, whatever they're doing in office. So, like my, my stance usually is that I, I tend to not put morality as front and center in elected officials in that – if I were on a plane 
and it became apparent to me that the pilot was having an affair, I wouldn't freak out because that seems un, 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 uh, unrelated to the act of flying the plane. It's not exhaustive, by the way. Like if someone's, you know, lying and all these different things, and I'd put Trump in that category of, of crossing that line and, and not just being unsavory, but being flat out immoral. Uh, yeah, I think that's going to impact the Republican brand a lot long term. And I, I think that there's a significant part of this that is just... There is a bullying element that's gone on from progressives towards middle America for a long time. That's something that I've been aware of when I was in New York. And I think that part of the response of that has been Trump hates all the right people and he's being mean to the people that we hate. So we're just gonna get on board with that. And I, I do not see that as being an aspirational value, uh, nor do I think that that's gonna further um, the, the conservative cause long term. I, I don't. I think he's gonna. I, I think he's gonna cause a lot more damage than people realize long term. Uh, long term in terms of branding. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's like, uh, yes, this current situation favors the red team or the blue team at the moment, but 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 not the game as a whole. And and I think you and I. Uh, we've talked a lot about how uh, we're, we're bigger fans of, of what benefits the game as a whole. Speaking yeah. of which, you want to talk about the, the one real collateral damage that, that, that I'm so bummed about uh, this whole Avash thing is, is that, um, is that uh, Judge Napolitano has been so vocal yeah. on, on supporting it that now I feel like, and I, I hope I'm not outing you here, uh, our dream of Judge Napolitano on the Supreme Court is definitely dead. Yeah. So I think I of, of his outspoken uh, disapproval. Yes, I, that is that is a sad thing. I, I really, I, so I, I know Judge Napolitano. I'm a friend of his. He is a, a brilliant man, uh, a, a very, very sharp guy, and a very dedicated originalist, which is my jurisprudential philosophy of choice. And so uh, I really wanted Donald Trump to appoint Judge Napolitano to the Supreme Court by virtue of the fact that he... And granted, and granted uh, Trump would do it for all the wrong reasons. He would do it because he's, he do it because he's on, on TV and, and he's on Fox. Um, yeah, he, he would do it for... And he'd do it because he, it would probably irritate progressives because there'd be a guy from Fox on, on the court. Uh, but I, I just... I like Napolitano is a dedicated originalist, a really smart guy. I would love that. Yes, I am very sad about that. He, he did an interview on Reason uh, maybe three weeks ago where, where and he'd, he'd already said this on Fox, um, but he came out and was like, yeah, Trump has committed impeachable things. And I think he's friends with Trump, or at least was previously. So I, I don't think that it was a, um, I, I don't think it was an emotionally motivated position for, for Napolitano to take. I think that he looked at the, looked at the case and went, yeah, he's, he's done this. And it is, that is a sad casualty because that would have, uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Andrew Napolitano would have been quite the coup uh, on, the, on the court. And that's probably, probably not going to happen now. Also, uh, why why are so few people talking about uh, the movie Midnight Run from the uh, late 80s uh, uh, with Robert De Niro and uh, Charles Grodin? Because that whole movie pivoted on the fact that they got the bad guy by claiming they had floppy disks with incriminating evidence and they got the guy to take the disks. And even though there was nothing on the disks, the fact that he took a physical action, and, and this is what we all have to come to learn about what it means to obstruct justice. It means uh, uh, taking a physical action action at a, a nexus point uh, with uh, the intent to protect yourself and, and uh, use, use power. Uh, that sounds an awful lot like what's in the Mueller report. The Mueller report, go watch Midnight Run. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm with you on that because I think the, the, the Mueller report did not draw a, 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 a collusion between the Trump administration and the Russians, uh, he, or the, the Trump, Trump campaign and the Russians. He did openly and gleefully accept help from them inadvertently when they would come out and do something that damaged Hillary Clinton. Like he was, they were all excited when Rus Russia was hurting her chances, but there does not appear to be um, a, a evidence of collusion between uh, Trump and, um, and the uh, the Russians, which is good. I'm like, I'm glad to hear that. That's a, a score for America. I, I like, I'm not rooting for, um, I, I'm, I'm not rooting for the president to be in the pocket of a foreign dictator. That like, that is not a, a, a laudable thing. That said though, uh, tr Trump did appear to uh, ask multiple people in his administration to um, either corral or, uh, or take over uh, elements of the investigation to try and um, stop things from happening. I mean, he, he wanted Jeff Sessions to be in charge of all of this. It's why Jeff Sessions isn't our attorney general anymore, uh, because Jeff Sessions was not um, pro-Trump enough. He was actually just doing his job rather than serving the president. And he he asked, like, uh, was it McGahn, um, the counsel, uh, that he, he wanted to 
uh, you know, sort of proactively be watching out for Trump's interest in it, and he wouldn't do it. Uh, same with uh, um, McFarland and a few other people that are mentioned in the, in the Mueller investigation, where I, I just, I have this impression that he told them to do something that they knew was illegal, and they went, uh, I'm going to leave at 3.30 p.m. today and just not, not deal with this. Uh, but again, the issue is, if, did you attempt to obstruct justice? And if attempting obstruction of justice is sufficient to get you in there, then the midnight run elements start factoring in. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, again, uh, impeachment is not a trial. Uh, impeachment is not the police. Impeachment is a manifestation of political will. And I, I honestly don't think that political will is there. And I think that um, it's a real bummer that the reason the will is not there is because the tact it's not tactically smart to do. And, and I tend to be, you know, as a misty eyed libertarian, more interested in the ethics of it. And of, I don't want to make it easy for the next guy down the line to feel like, well, Trump danced over here and, and nothing happened. Yeah. And we're, we're, we are not, uh, super used to doing that. Like that was one of the concerns with having impeachment uh, in general, and this goes to multiple administrations, is this fear that impeachment will become a frequent tool um, for political purposes. There's a guy in office we don't like, we want to remove him, which to be fair is a significant portion of the people calling for impeachment. It's not that there's a, a clear bright line in their mind of, of an illegal activity or a, um, an activity. These are, these are the same people who would instantly claim that, uh, 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 well, depending on how you squint, Bill Clinton didn't lie under oath. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a team-based thing. There, there's, yeah, there's a significant amount of partisan rancor going into this, um, which is fair. But the idea that we're going to overuse it has, I think, been fairly well overturned by history, given that we've only impeached two people in the nation's history. We would have impeached Nixon. So three out of 200 years, not bad. There, there, um, there's a certain school of thought that um, it would probably be good to have a mechanism like um, a, a no-confidence vote that they get over in the United Kingdom, where... Uh, now, granted, she wasn't ousted by a no-confidence vote, uh, but Theresa May nearly got ousted by a no-confidence vote twice. And, uh, and, and just in, in that situation, it's like, look, like you, the, the governing is so poor under a certain person that it would better the, the government as a whole to, to move them. I do think it would be good to have something like that. Maybe, maybe we should just, rather than calling it impeachment, maybe we should have a new mechanism called uh, a failure of confidence where, where we can, you know, uh, put, in, put in Pence or whatever, or George Takei. Well, I, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't even know that we need to to come up with a different label for it. You know, uh, English is a living language, and and what we think of as impeachment right now may come to mean something else. It means, uh, you know, the trial by fire that every president experiences in his third year, and and I'd be okay with that. Uh, the more nervous politicians I see, the happier <laughs> I get. Yeah, you know what? I, I, well, we'll go ahead and close on that note, Brian. I I am all for any situation that creates permanently nervous politicians. That is that is one exactly. in which they're they're probably doing the, 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 will, uh, the will of the people. Uh, agreed, agreed, agreed. Wonderful. Brian, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Uh, you know what? Uh, we're, we're doing a bunch of uh, fun new stuff over at youtube.com slash scam, uh, scam school is the, the channel. But uh, last week we had a world champion card thrower teach us the secret to forcing a, car, a, a, a coin flip. You can cheat a coin flip now. Every time you flip a coin, you can decide in advance whether it's going to land heads or tails. And uh, that episode is up. I think it came out last week at youtube.com slash scam school. Nice. Thank you, Brian. On iTunes, JL Kidd says, Heaton discusses serious topics, but without ever taking himself too seriously. The Friday release valve in particular is hilarious, but my favorite line describing the president of Evergreen College as a wet doily of a human being came during a serious topic of deplatforming on college campuses. I think I took that from Frazier. I think someone described Niles that way, but I am very happy to uh, combine Frazier with politics. Thank you for that very kind review. Also, did you guys know we sell merch? That's right. If you go to shop.theblaze.com, you can get t-shirts of some of our sponsors, Jillian's Rooster Removal, Nick's Horseless Diner, Uncle Milton's Caffeinated Crab Dip, Bigfoot for Congress, and of course, my favorite diner, Snuffy's off Route 44. I'm pretty sure if you buy the shirt, I don't get any cut of the profit, but if you tweet me a picture of you in it, we'll post it on the show. And if you tweet me a picture of you without it, it'll make my day. You can watch this whole show on YouTube if you look for Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. You can see my handsome bearded face and assortment of suits and the dead buffalo head we screwed to the wall. Watching Something's Off with Andrew Heaton on your computer or your phone will add years to your life and inches to your hair. 
So go to YouTube and start watching full episodes. I look like the guy you'd come to ask for permission to marry your robot sex doll. <laughs> All right. Remember, you can always tweet me at Mighty Heaton or Facebook me at facebook.com slash Mighty Heaton or even email me by subscribing to my newsletter at MightyHeaton.com and just replying when I send it out on Fridays. Also, we're doing a new thing around here, Facebook Live videos. We did one last week and another one today, and I got some fun and interesting questions. If you follow us on Facebook, you'll know when those are about to pop up, and then you can join in the fun. Finally, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That helps other people discover this here political orphanage. Thank you, and good day. Thank you.